All right, we're recording now. So what's up, man? Thank you for being here with me. Absolutely, cool. man. No, very, very happy to be on here and, uh, you know, glad and see if I can, you know, really shed some light on a couple of things and have a great conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So we share a lot of, a lot of same interests. So we listen to Joe Rogan a lot. We're all really big yeah. into like nutrition, science, and things like that. And of course, you know, physical and mental fitness. So, uh, so with that being said, if you would go ahead and kind of introduce yourself and give that a little bit of a background, and then we'll get into it and see where the conversation goes. All right, absolutely. So to give you the very short version, um, you know, I, I was all around athlete since I was a kid. I mean, my earliest memories, you know, three, four years old you know, playing sports, everything all the way through high school. And, you know, I was a big dude then. I mean, when I played football, I mean, I was, I was a lineman. So I was big my entire life. I had those, you know, I always big man genetics. Um, it was always hard for me to lose weight. And so like, you know, I kind of used like, you know, being a football player as an excuse that I can eat crap and you know, just eat a lot of calories because I expend it and I need to be big and strong. And, um, you know, I went to play college football and actually you know, I'm wearing my slippery rock shirt right now, <laughs> um, you know, nose tackle, D tackle. And, you know, I played there for a few, for, for my entire college career, had a, you know, we won two conference championships, but I was like, I was, I was pretty big. Like my heaviest was almost like 300 pounds and, um, you know, I didn't carry it well. And I kind of dealt with a lot of injuries, you know, not, not a lot. I mean, I, I, I got first hit with an ACL. So I had, I've had two knee reconstructions. And then, you know, the second one happened when I was in college, when I was playing ball and it was actually during practice, which was more depressing. And, you know, know. so I had a, I had an experience working with a lot of physical therapists and that's what actually kind of got me into that health route. Cause you know, I I went to school for exercise and rehabilitative sciences. Cause I, you know, as an athlete, I always want to know how can I get bigger, faster, stronger, you know, what can I do to improve my performance? And, um, and then I started learning a little bit more about rehab, you know, just working with physical therapists and the surgeons that I had, I, you know, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of really great doctors, and I've always tried to learn from them as much as possible. Um, so I always feel like, you know, you can learn a lot from books, but you learn 10 times as much from experience and being in the field and seeing things with your own eyes. And, you know, it, I'm sure you as, a, you know, in your, in your profession, like you've, you've learned a lot more in the field than any book could have taught you sometimes. And, um, oh, 100%. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of times you'll go, because unfortunately, you have, you, have, you have the class time, then you have like clinicals. You have to be out in the field doing these ride-alongs <clears throat> with like working crews for hundreds of hours so you kind of get like okay well there's like the way like the test goes and this is the way you're really going to do it when you hit the field and I feel like every profession has that for sure too mm-hmm. and um you know through throughout college and that's when I started working you know in training facilities you know I was very fortunate in that as well like I mean I've even in college I got to work with professional athletes a lot of NFL athletes Olympic athletes you know and so I got to learn from that and really experience, you know, what it's like to train at that, you know, caliber level and also even to coach that caliber level. Um, so I actually even got to personally train, you know, uh, certain Redskins and people who came into our facility at times. So it was like, you know, even at a young age, a lot of these dudes like still actually took my advice and like, you know, trained with me. And uh, so it was really awesome. And that's where, you know, once I graduated, you know, I knew I wasn't going to the NFL. Like, you know, I, I, I was like, you know what? Let's, uh, let's walk into a Gold's Gym. I got a seven-day pass. I ended up becoming a fitness manager there. You know, very successful, and I really learned how, how to start helping people. And, and I, I, I basically, you know, I worked as af- with athletes, and I was used to that. And then, like, you go from that to, like, a Gold's Gym in Leesburg, which Leesburg is a very, you know, family-oriented type place. You're getting your – Virginia, family, right? Because Leesburg, dad. Florida is a far different place. it's like your everyday mom and dads who working in dc working in the city commuting all day so it's like it's a whole shift and you know i had to really adapt and it was like you know learning how to work with all different types of people Mm -hmm. and that's where i really learned that a lot of what i like you know learned in college you know it was great but it was really just a piece of paper that got to hang up on my wall like i got to learn like how metabolisms really worked how everybody was different And, you know, when you're putting people through workouts and the biggest thing I learned was really the mindset, actually, because as an athlete, it was always like grind hard, push hard. But then I always understand like, okay, I'm giving you like, hey, here's the workouts. I wrote you a diet. So like, where are we having struggles? So I never really understood that concept because for me, it was like, okay, my coach told coach told me something. Boom. You either do it or you're you're running or you're like, there's, there's always a consequence if you didn't do what coach told you to. So it was kind of, it was great. You know, I got to learn how to work with, you know, I had my oldest patient, or I would say patient, because I I do think of myself as a medical professional, but he was 93 years old, you know, World War II vet. Um, He fought in Korean War as well. I mean, badass dude. But it was like, I mean, I learned, again, how to put someone, and he said, like, you know, strength training for him was 
the best thing that he could ever do because it's like he felt like he got new life coming out of it. And I had every walk of life in between. I even trained kids as young as five and six years old, teaching them how to run and even just how to do push up, like fun type of stuff, getting kids more active. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got to work with a great, you know, range of people. And I was very successful. I was very fortunate um, that, you know, I was able to open up my own facility. Now, this is where my story starts to go a little crazy. Now, at this time, you know, I'm training. I'm still an athlete. You know, I'm competing. In, like, I wanted to compete in bodybuilding. And um, that's so over where, the course of those last few years, like, you'd been getting in shape that whole time. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. So, like, after, I, after football was done, like, I dropped. There was a show at my school. And, you know, I, my school is a big bodybuilding, powerlifting school as well as a football school. And I was like, you know what? I got 16 weeks. Let's just see what it's like because I've never been lean my entire life. So right when I – Right when we got knocked out of the college uh, division two playoffs, I was like, boom, cut starts right now. And I ended up dropping about 65 pounds in those 16 weeks to do my first competition. And like, I just Holy fell cow. in love with the sport because unlike everything I did before, like team sports, you're competing against other people. Bodybuilding really taught me. It's like, you're competing against yourself. It was a mental game all the time. Cause I mean, I also, I lived in the, the football slash fraternity house and trying to like diet and while everyone's drinking beer and eating pizza, it was, it was difficult, but it taught me really, again, um, it was that mental aspect taught me how to restrain. And like, you know, if you have a goal, you know, here's what you have to do to get to that goal. And that's like, that's another valuable lesson I learned. It's like, you know, knowing what you want in life and reverse engineering on how to get there. What is that end point? You know, it's never going to be a perfect straight line, but it's like, you know, if this is my goal, you know, what do I need to do on a monthly basis, break that down into weekly basis and then daily basis. Um, and that's what I really got to learn how to do, especially when it came to my health and fitness. Mm. And I took that concept and applied it with all of my clients. And, you know, by no means I was a terrible salesman. I was not any of that, type, but I was a good trainer and I knew how to help people. And that's what made us very successful. And I was able to you know, save up enough money. And when the time was right, I left and opened up my own little facility. Um, so it's a small personal training facility. And so I really got to, and I took my good trainers with me. But I got to do what I wanted to really do with people. Because when you're working a corporate gym, there's restrictions. Like you can't do this. You can't do that. You know, like, and we couldn't, like, it, it became to them more about the money than it was helping the, the client. Mm. And that's when we left. And we did great. And, I mean, I was the best start to any small business a man could ask for. Um, but about nine months in is when, I'd say, shit started hitting the fan a little bit. And there was a combination of things. Because uh, I always looked, I was very fit. But I always didn't look at, I didn't look at mental health the way that I do now. I didn't even think mental health had any really effect on my physical health at all. And we're going to get a lot more into that as I'm kind of telling my story. Because um, it really started, you know, my first, the first symptoms of my cancer really started in my brain. Um, and I thought it was just stress, you know, because at that time I actually had to, you know, fire my two best friends who were in the gym helping me. They were doing a lot of things they shouldn't have. It's a long story, but I had to let them go. Um, um, for very, very, very good reason. So it was that I was also in a very, you know, bad relationship, more mentally abusive and things like that. So it was a combination of, you know, all this stress, trying to run the business, everything's going wrong. And then it was like, I noticed that there is, there's something going on with my body. Cause normally like I could take a challenge and be like, okay, if we're, we're down in the dirt, we got to pull ourselves back up. Here's what we got to do. But like, I just didn't have the energy and I kind of started to lose my drive. And I became very forgetful. So this is like October. So this is about three years ago. This is gone like October, 2017. And I noticed that I just started slowing down a little bit and I wasn't as, you know, not just not motivated. Cause like, again, the physical part of my deficiencies became the mental part. And I, I would forget things. Like you would tell me, Hey Sam, like, don't forget, send me that email right when I go. So I can, you know, check this out and I my program or whatever. I would come sit down on my computer. I would look at them and be like, Oh shit, what was I supposed to do? Like, I just come, I would just forget. Um, my short term memory was just very faulty. And again, I got frustrated at myself because I hold myself to a higher standard. So it was like, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on with me. Um, fast forward, you know, going through November, it's like, okay, things kind of keep going down south. And I ended up going to this lecture. One of my clients he actually took me to this guy's, uh, he does these lectures like, you know, every three weeks or he did do them um, in, his, in his practice. So he is, uh, He's a doctor, applied kinesiologist, nutrition. He, he does everything in his big facility. He's a very famous doctor. He was actually Tony Robbins' uh, personal doctor um, during the 90s. And it was really cool hearing stories about, like, you know, Tony Robbins. I don't know if you're into personal development and know Tony Robbins a little bit. but it was I know like, the name. Yeah, I'm familiar with the name. 
Um, but I mean, he, he's traveled the world, worked with a lot of celebrities, but really, really cool guy all around. But is, this topic was on brain health. Now, my client brought me there to learn his marketing strategies and see what he was doing to bring in new clients and stuff. But I was like, I was actually more interested in the brain lecture. I was like, it just happened cool to be cool. a brain <laughs> lecture. It just happened to be. And he what brought, are the odds, dude? It was meant to be. And he, it's funny because he brought this army doctor in. And this army doctor was, I mean, been in Iraq, been in Afghanistan. And he was working on ways to help our troops with PTSD. He's like, what we're doing right now is not working. He was showing us the stats. He's like, what these guys are going through and they're coming home. And it's like, you know, even right now I'm getting chilled. Like this thing about the, the suicide rate, you know, homeless rate, you know, what these guys go through, um, you know, it's, it's worse when they come back. And it's like, how can we fix that? Because again, giving them these pills, what we're prescribing is just not working. Mm -hmm. So he gave this whole lecture about, Believe it or not, he was talking about fats and how our brain fuel gets fueled by fats and how we need a certain ratio, not omega-3s. So he was actually talking a lot about omega-6 to omega-9 ratios. And he was going through, and again, this was some really deep science. It's not something that I have perfectly memorized and can recite, but it was really interesting to hear. But he was also talking about, and he was looking at different parts of the brain when he put these pictures up. He's like, you know, this part of your brain is deficient in these nutrients. You know, you can start to see these types of, you know, symptoms. And, you know, a lot of more like anxiety, stress, depression, you know, um, losing focus, memory loss, things like that. So, again, long story short, like afterwards, like, you know, I shook it. I met the guy. And I was like, you know what? I, I got to see this because what they were offering was these little, you know, type of brain scans and tests where you go in there, you do certain blood work, they would do a couple other tests, and then you would actually take a, on a computer, you would take a cognitive test. And it would test all your short-term memory and all, all sorts of different things. And so I set up my first session, uh, session with Dr. Roselle, excuse me, and um, you know, it was weird because, so you go in there for the initial assessment, he does blood work, he, he predicted a lot, like he could just look at my body, he was testing me in different ways, and he was like, all right, this is what I am going to expect to come back. And he just listed off of things like, you know, deficiencies, uh, areas that I'm lacking in. And so when I came back two weeks later to see my results and do my follow-up, you know, he, I had like a 12 page report with my blood work, everything. It was incredible oh, wow. to see everything that was going on with my body. But he was like, but he was right. Like 98% of the time on everything he predicted. And he was able to do that. And I was like, and I was just mind blown. Like, how did that happen? But it was like, he showed me that I was, you know, very basic deficiencies, like, you know, vitamin D3, iron, you know, zinc, uh, and uh, there's a lot of other little stuff. But also, he was looking at different parts of the brain. Now, what I saw from that little scan was, you know, my fat ratios were off, but the main thing was like, my cognitive function was at 45%. My short-term memory was at 40% my inflammation in my brain cells were over 70%. So again, right there, he was like, okay, there's some red flags that are going on. And, it, and, you know, this is not something that my normal doctor would have ever looked at, you know, right. my physician, like they don't, they don't go into that type of depth. So I started working with this guy and, you know, over the course of a couple months, we, he was doing a lot of like, again, he was fixing my mineral nutrient deficiencies. Cause here's the thing at the time, like I was in the peak of my training and my diet. Now, I believe now, like now knowing what I know, it's like I was overeating, but I mean, I was eating about seven to 8,000 calories a day minimum. Like I was training six days a week. I mean, I was in the peak of my, you know, performance, my, my physique. Um, I was fit, but I didn't realize I was overtaxing my system because what one thing you notice, you know, my liver enzymes were up, my kidneys were, you know, starting to shut down. I was protein deficient, even though I was eating about 500 grams of protein a day. So my body just wasn't absorbing it. Mm. I was putting, I think, because I took okay. multivitamins. Yeah. It wasn't like I didn't take multivitamins. It wasn't like I was eating my vegetables. I was eating, I was perfect. I was eating, I mean, granted, I was eating about a pound of chicken breast a day, a pound of turkey, a half a pound of salmon, and a pound of steak. You no, know, there's a total of three and a half pounds of meat a day. So there's no way I should have been like, you know, protein deficient. Right. So again, just to fast forward, because I know I went kind of in depth on that. And, you know, these are the symptoms I started noticing on my cancer. And then, started like, you know, I started getting these torrential night sweats. And it was like, I mean, I have a king cow bed, like I would, I mean, soak one part, roll over, soak another, roll over, soak another. And then in the morning, I just take off my sheets and everything, throw them in the washer and do it the next night. And with that, you know, I also started developing you know, this type of sleep apnea, which they said it wasn't sleep apnea, but like, I just was not breathing. 
And, um, you know, that's another area. Like, I didn't realize, like, you know, breathing is so essential. If there's one tip that I can give anybody, if you want to fix your health and fix your life, and there's one thing that you can do, like one single thing, learn how to breathe properly. I don't know if you saw this, uh, one of Joe Rogan's latest podcasts, I think it was maybe about a month ago, with uh, James Nestor, the book Breathe. Um, oh, I haven't listened to that one yet, no. You have to. It is, I'll put it in his top five. Because I, really? I read this dude's book, and I'm going to go through it like three or four times, but it is the science that he brings up, and like his website, like he has over 500 scientific articles and published like peer-reviewed articles, and he backs everything up. But he talks about, you know, the whole science of breathing and our balance of oxygen and CO2. And that's something I learned with Dr. Roselle then. You know, my body was extremely acidic. And I'm going to talk a little bit about alkalinity because it is one of those, I'm saying not taboo subjects, but it is an area that a lot of people, especially in the medical field, really battle on. Mm. And, you know, it's really tossed down and I like, talked about as, you know, I would say like pseudoscience or things like that. Because every different cell in our body is supposed to have a different pH level. You know, our blood has a very specific pH. If our blood gets out of that pH balance, alkaline or acidic, we die. Right. You know? So there's a range for everything. The same thing with our muscle cells. Like think about when you're ex, like when you're, let's say if you were to go out and run a half marathon right now and you start to hit that wall and you get that burning sensation, we all know that lactic acid. Okay. You're on a leg extension. You know, we can get that, like where our lactic acid, there's, there's such thing as called a lactate threshold. That wall that you hit is when the lac, our lactic acid hits that threshold and then our muscle power basically just starts to drop. But the mm. way that we get lactic acid out of the muscle is oxygen. So again, by breathing. So again, if you're doing like, you know, let's say like a 50 rep burnout and you hit a wall and it's just so much burn, you have to stop. <sighs> Boom. Keep going. You don't need right. a 50 second rest like you would if you're doing a, you know, 10 rep max. You can just take a deep breath and keep going because now you got oxygen into that muscle. You're taking the acid out and alkalizing. And a lot of it has to do with the mitochondria in the cell. And that's a whole, whole nother subject. You know, I, I do a lot of reading on and really kind of diving into that as well. Um, so my point being is like, I started noticing all these symptoms and my breathing was off my, you know, and I started getting better though. All the things that he was giving me, you know, naturally, homeopathically, you know, fixing my nutrition, it was all working, but then something happened. And it was like, you know, I was, it was kind of too late for me. And I was getting ready to go to Columbia with my buddies, a trip that we plan. Um, Cause we like to travel. We pick a different country, you know, every, you know, twice a year. And, um, you know, it was two days before I left and I was like, you know, I'm just going to go check my physician and he ended up, you know, checking it out. And I started feeling like, cause there was like a, there's a tightness in my neck that I had for about a month. And I was like, mm. what's going on? Like, I mean, it wasn't anything I could fix. I'll roll it out, massage it. And I was like, okay, let me just get it checked out. So he ends up doing an ultrasound, you know, I go, I'm in Columbia, I'm on, I'm at a cafe on the beach drinking. Uh, and I get a call from my doctor and he was like, so, um, you know, what, what you found there wasn't a, was not a tightness in your neck. You know, we found some nodules and I was like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, so yeah, you have some nodules going from the back of your brain down, down here into your thyroid and on your glands. He's like, when you get back to the States, like we have to check you out right when you get back. And like, that's when I was just sitting there all like, well, shit, like, <laughs> well, bro, call me on the last day before I get back. I like, don't give that to me on day two of vacation. And it was just like, man, it was a, but I, I didn't, I didn't tell my buddies like, you know, I'm not going to ruin this trip. Like, I'm like, you know what, we're going to, we're going to still have our fun. Like, you know, and then I'm going to come back and get it checked out. And I was like, you know what? And, but it was right then and there that I was like, you know, intuitively I knew that I had cancer and that is where I really like, I always, I always prided myself on having a very strong mindset and being mentally tough. And, you know, I think it was like, it's a lot of that, you know, masculinity when you're growing up, like you gotta be strong, like, you know, tough, hard ass, like, you know, and you know, I was kind of like, I mean, I was a very nice dude to anybody. I wasn't like a, like an asshole, but I was like, I was like tough on myself. And, you know, that created a lot of really bad habits. And then even like psychologically later, now that I'm learning about this stuff, it's like, you know, I, I realized how much that mental aspect plays a role in our physical health, where the moment I heard those words, like, I, or I knew that I had cancer in my own head, I was like, all of my symptoms, the moment I got back in the States, it took off times a hundred. I'm talking about like, it spread like oh, wildfire. Shit. Within a week, those nodules became a dozen and you could palpate, you could feel it coming down here. Um, this started to grow out. It was a golf ball within a week baseball within a month, softball within six weeks. Like lump like around your, in your throat and your neck. Oh yeah. I mean, this bulged out to here. Oh my and, God. Um, so like when I got back and 
I mean, because I was doing great up to that trip. I mean, I, I ended that relationship. I mean, I was fixing my health. I was motivated again. I was getting back into it. And I was like, you know, I'm finally going to be able to compete. So I dealt with, honestly, like before cancer, like I was going through the toughest time of my life. And, you know, before, in those previous, you know, year and a half, like I, I got cut open 10 times, not 10, like in the previous day, de- in that whole decade, I got cut open at least 12 times. I've been under anesthesia more times than I can remember because I had a lot of surgeries that went bad, doctors that kind of screwed. I've had a lot of bad things. Like, you know, it was a series of unfortunate events up to that point. And for me, cancer was like a nail in the coffin. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I went back in that dark place. And that was, those six weeks were probably like the worst six weeks of my life. And when I, when I got back, and I mean, I'm talking about like my, because when I was going through like my symptoms, it wasn't just, you know, memory. Like I couldn't get up in the morning. I mean, I had to drag myself out of bed. The only energy I had, like, because I, I was not giving up my training because that's what made me happy. I couldn't give it up. So I was like, I, I gave up building my business. I kind of like my clients, a lot of my clients left me at that time. They didn't really know what was going on, but it's like, I couldn't, I mean, I wasn't going above and beyond. I was doing what I was supposed to. I was training them, but I wasn't, I didn't have that same fire that I was mm-hmm. trying to give to them. And during that time, I mean, I remember, you know, just wishing my life would end. I mean, honestly, I was like, you know, God, if, if this is cancer, just give me that. Like if it's terminal cancer, Hey, I'm going to take my money in the bank. I'm going to go die on a beach in Mexico or something like, you know, I'm going to live my life, you know, at the end here. Right. And that's when like, you know, I, I got it checked out and I went and the doctor kind of knew he was like, okay, you have these symptoms. It's very, this is probably what it is. He didn't tell me that, but I got the biopsy. It came back and it was like, you know, I got the call and it was like, you know, you have cancer. And in my head, like a lot of times when people hear those words, it's like, Oh shit. Like they have this moment for me. Like I already knew what it was. Like I just already intuitively knew that it was cancer. And it was like, okay, tell me how bad it is though. Like, what, what are we dealing with here? Am I, do I have brain cancer, or like terminal brain cancer, or is this like, you know, something that's not that bad? Right. And that's when he was like, you know, it, it's most likely, you know, this type of thing. And so I went to my oncologist and, you know, that's when he kind of told me, and, you know, this is where I, I, anybody who's listening to this and like, if you're going through something medically, make sure that you have the right person that you're talking to. Because I went to an office and like I was just another number. When I sat with an oncologist, he was with me for five minutes, basically telling me, okay, this is what you have. All right, boom, boom, boom. Here's the treatment. And we're good. And I was like, yo, man, no, 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 we're not good. Like, if you're going to tell me I have cancer at, you know, 20, so you're going to explain to me a little bit what is actually going on, how these treatments going to go. But it was just like, they're trying to get me in and out of that office. And I was like, dude, this is not like a little like routine checkup. This, you're an oncologist. So like I ended up firing that dude and I went and found somebody else. Good. Um, Cause it was like, I, I didn't want to feel like I was just another number and someone who they can check off the list who came in today and boom. Right. Um, Especially with cancer. Let's sit in like, a, like your throat's a little scratchy and you have a headache. This is cancer. Exactly. And like, you know, I was like, and that's when things started to really hit me because at that point my insurance let, told me that we also don't cover anything. So like when I had to get that PET scan, that was like five grand. And I was like, they're like, uh, we don't cover this. So I was like, well, what do you mean you don't cover this? And I, I kind of got stuck with, you know, the, the Obamacare, I, you know, one of those shitty insurance, like the insurance company, it's weird because I wasn't paying that much less than I am now, but it was like, I thought I had everything covered, but I found out that I didn't. Um, so like all those checkups, all, and all the treatments, everything. So I found out like when I learned like what this treatment's going to cost, I was like, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to go into debt. Like I'll be in debt for the rest of my life. You know, my treatment over the course of the entire, it was about $1.4 million. Jesus and, Christ. Um, so like that was, so again, you're adding the mental, like thinking about that when it's like, okay, I need to survive cancer. But now it's like, well, fuck it. If I survive, like I'm not even gonna, like, I'm not going to have anything. And it's like, what's the know, point? All you're going to do is have to work and give all your money back. I thought like, you know, I was going to lose the gym. I thought I was going to lose. Like, I mean, I ended, up, did, I ended up having to move back in with my parents and, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a rough time because I remember, and, you know, this is a big staple part, staple mark of my story, you know, because those six weeks, it just kept getting worse and worse. And I was like, okay, the insurance isn't covering anything, you know, where the gym's not bringing in the money it was like, we're, you know, we're not in the green that much. So it's like, you're draining all your savings that you put in. Then it, it just hit me and I was, I remember this day and I was on the phone with like 13 different insurance companies and just asked like, yo, what can you guys do to help me? Like, you know, I have cancer. I'm not getting treatment. Cause like the next insurance, or sorry, the next oncologist, you know, 
I ended up firing him too. Like we had, we had a big dispute, but I was like, he, he looked at me and like, he didn't, there was no sense of urgency. Like when I say this was taken off like wildfire, like I, I was initially um, diagnosed at stage 2B. So for Hodgkin's lymphoma, you know, there is obviously, you know, stage one through four. And because I had the night sweats, there's a, there's another little, it's a very variable that makes it a lot more deadly. Um, so like I was given about like a 75% chance of survival rate, you know, compared to 80% if you just had regular, um, you know, stage two. Now that stage two turned into stage three like that, where it was spreading, where I went down my lymph nodes in my armpits, down into my pelvis. Now, and I explained that to because I went in for one of my checkups, and this is when they were trying to work with me on the insurance, and we were trying to get everything happening. But, like, I was supposed to get treatment on June June 1st. I walked in there for treatment, and they denied it to me. They're like, no, sorry, like, we can't give this to you. Like, I was like, what do you mean? Like, I told, like, I told you I was going to pay for this or whatever I had to pay just to, just to get my treatment. Um, you know, where's my doctor at? I was like, oh, your doctor's not even here. Like, what do you mean he's not even here? Like, he was at the hospital, and we were in the office, and I was like, he was supposed to see me anyways. And so like they sent out the, the, the nurse, not, even, not the nurse, sorry, the tech. And you know, it's not anything against those people, but like, she is not a doctor. She is a tech. She knows a lot of things, but when it comes to like making these types of decisions, whether to send me to the hospital for treatment, like emergency treatment or not, I didn't think she, she wasn't qualified enough to, and she also didn't know anything. Like I've never met with her before. So she was never like my tech. She didn't sound like she looked at my scans before. And I was like, you see what this is, like, this is spreading, like, I, I have to get this treatment. And they're like, well, sorry, there's nothing we can do. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't order it. And I was like, I told you on the phone to order it, like, I have money, like, I'll pay for it. And it was just, it was a whole mess. And that's when I was like, all right, guys, like, you're like, this, this is a problem. And, you know, it was, it was just a tough. So now, like, you're worrying about losing all the money you have, uh, losing your life to cancer. And the entire time you can't even find a doctor that will help you not die to cancer. So you have all those stresses all at once. Yeah. And to me, honestly, like I forgot about the money. I was like, you know what? It's money. You know, I, I can make more. It's whatever. Like I want, like, you know, I just need to live. Like I, I, it was just, it was a matter of life and death at that point. It was like, and the thing was like, it's one of the more curable cancers. So I was like, come on guys. Like, it's not like I'm like, I'm dying from one of the, something that we can cure. And that's when, you know, there's a, there's a switch that happened. And again, that day that I was on the phone with 13 insurance companies and like, you know, the last one I talked to was this Christian group. And like, he's like, all right, man, I'm going to tell you to you straight. You now here's why we can't do this. And this is why everyone else denied you. And he explained it. And I was like, there's something like you get in before and it's a big pool. And it's like, you know, people put money in. And it's like, you know, if anybody who just got sick and decided they need to come need money, they would just come to us. And like, we wouldn't have anything for the people who've been putting in for it. And I understood that. So I was sitting on the couch in my gym and it's like one of those times no one's in there. Like I usually train like, you know, one to four is like a, a dead period. And I was sitting on the couch and I'll never forget this moment for the rest of my life. And I was sitting there and it was just like, I looked, I was looking at the floor and I was like, you're going to die here on this couch. Cause at that time, like I couldn't even stand for a 30 minute session with my clients. Like I had to sit down. Like if I were to do an extra, like I had like these little shots of oxygen that we had in the gym. Like, you know, I physically, like, I mean, I couldn't do it. And right when those words came out of my mouth, like you're going to die here on this couch, there was a voice in the back of my head and it was, it was my voice, but it's like, I didn't really create this, you know, this sentence. And it was just something that said, get up, get the fuck up and go lift something heavy like this is not your time and there was just a fire that kind of lit and I just stood up and I was like I just got this rush and I was like okay not today and I just remember you know I was warming up and I threw on like you know I, I was doing some deadlifts that day and I was like okay let's hit one plate and I was throwing another plate let's throw on another plate and then it was like you know I ended up hitting like 500 pounds on this deadlift and I was like, you know what, you know, a couple hours ago, I couldn't even stand for the session, but here I am putting up this weight. Now, again, I'll, I'll get into a little of the science behind all this, but like, I didn't have oxygen, but you know, that type of lifting is anaerobic. So like, I could deadlift 500 pounds, but I couldn't deadlift 135 for more than 20, 20 25 reps, because I mean, I would be out of breath and pass out. Use the oxygen up real quick. So I was just straight anaerobic, and I was like, okay, if I can do this, I can build a program around it. So that's when I really started going back to the drawing board and I started doing my research and I started looking at everything. And 
this is the part, like you go on, you know, I call it Dr. Google there. There's a million articles that pop up there. So how do you sift through? And luckily, you know, I, I do, I have a great educational background. I work with a lot of doctors and I have worked with cancer patients in the past. Like, you know, and it was actually, you know, a really funny story that like at right at that time, my very first cancer patient that and she had a thyroid cancer, but her thyroid cancer spread to the bone. And she, because again, thyroid cancer is not one of the more like most people, sometimes people go through it their whole life and not know that they had thyroid cancer. Um, but if it spreads, that's when thyroid cancer being, can be extremely deadly. And, you know, with her, she had to do this like ionized diet where like literally it was like for four to five weeks just to get these scans. Like you have to, you can only eat like 400, 500 calories a day. Oh a lot God. of it was like gummy bears. Like she had to eat, like there were certain sugars, like she could, there like her list of foods was like about this long that she could eat. Um, and, but luckily, you know, that's when I was like, okay, well, we can't do this, this, this diet. You can't do these. Like, what about a ketogenic diet? And believe it or not for her, it was extremely successful. And cause she didn't stop. Awesome. You know, and the ketogenic diet was a very, it worked very well for her. Now I was like, okay, I look, when I did my research, I caused the ketogenic diets when it comes to diseases, you know, it's been used back since uh, 1917, 1918. They used it for epilepsy and, you know, that diet's been used way before the Atkins in the late 60s, early 70s. I know it was like, I know 70s is when it got really big. Mm. Um, but Dr. Atkins, I think, created it in the late 60s. But before that, it was used um, for a lot of, you know, brain deficiencies, like, you know, epilepsy. And they, there's the fats. It's putting a lot of those fats in to really fuel your brain. So I was looking at that. And, but every diet that I looked at, there was flaws to it. And that's where, like, I knew alkalinity. And I was like, okay, right now I know my body's very acidic. And I could taste it. I could feel it. And um, that's something once you have cancer and also with the chemo, and I'll get into the chemo, like what that does to your body. But I knew that I had to do something because I wasn't getting treatment and I had to take, I had to take control of my life. That was the big switch. It wasn't like I, I created a miracle diet or this. It, what made all of this happen, it was my mind. And it was a decision that I made that I'm not going to be another statistic and I'm not going to be a victim to this disease. And that's what it takes. If you have the mindset, you will find a way to do it. Whether it's with Crohn's disease, whether it's with, you know, I want to say even COVID, we're not going to get political with that just yet. <laughs> but with anything though, I mean, again, we all, we all have trials and tribulations in our life. It's how do we respond? And I responded with, you know, I'm going to make this happen. And this is also where I started using, I started making my own cannabis oils. So I was doing a, I combined a ketogenic and uh, alkaline diet and I added a third aspect called carb backloading. So controlling the timing of my carbs, because here's the thing, insulin, and you don't want certain growth hormones running through your body when you have cancer cells. Growth hormone can be good if you're trying to build muscle, but it can also increase size of tumor cells. Again, now everybody, a lot of this science, like there's a lot of things that aren't a hundred percent, like, you know, that have a hundred peer reviewed articles of a you know, double blind study. A lot of this is a lot of, there's a lot of speculation and there's a lot of things that were going out around there. And that's why like the research, you have to really look at the fine details. And, but at that point it was like, you know what, obviously there's no, none of these studies are done on cancer patients because they're not going to put like the, the ethical parts of do, running a study. Like you can't, they're not going to put cancer patients on these types of diets. And like, you know, it's, and every cancer is different. So it's like, there's not a lot of research when it comes to that. There's a lot of people who have used things who were successful in there, but there's also people who used it, that diet and didn't make it. And that's the hard part. And that's also an, a hard, that was a hard aspect for me trying to help other people with cancer. Cause I know that there are ways to heal the body and the way that cancer works is, you know, it, it doesn't just magically pop up. You know, you have these cancer cells and when those cancer cells multiply and get big enough, that's when you see, that's when you visibly see something happening. And that's when you start really getting the full, you know, effects of, of the cancer. So, you know, I was doing my diet and I started using the cannabis. I made my own oils. So like, I actually, you know, learned everything about cannabis and I, I, I never really smoked till after college. Like I, I always had insomnia since I was like 10 years old. That was the first thing in my life that helped me. Um, so I used to, again, just do a little bit before bed if I needed it and it would put me out for seven hours. But then once I started going through this and I wasn't getting treatment, I was like, okay, people have used this it's not going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. So I had a strain for the day. I had a strain to help me eat. I had a strain to help me go to sleep. You know, I learned how to make, you know, the best oils, but also like, I mean, it was something I could just drop under my tongue, put in my food. And it was also keto and alkaline. So it fit perfectly with my diet. 
I started noticing a complete shift in my body, my energy, my, my brain actually was really one of the first things I noticed that, man, I can, I can think again, like I can remember. Um, and it just all started to come together for me. And that's where luckily, you know, a couple weeks later is when we found a little loophole with insurance and I ended up getting like business insurance through this and this. I'm like, we had to work some things out, but luckily one of my clients was a broker. So he knew how to do all this. And I ended up getting, Dude, you thank know, God for your clients. I, you know, I, as much, you know, I, I, I have a really great group of people, you know, I luckily, you know, when you work with so many people, I'm sure the same with you, like you get to meet a lot of people and you create, you know, relationships and friendships and you get to learn about people. And, you know, luckily again, it was just, uh, it was meant to be, I had a client who was really close with me. who was an insurance broker and he just made it happen. So, I mean, in the beginning, you know, it did, it did bankrupt me. I lost, you know, most of my money, but it was like, I, I, I learned that money doesn't bring happiness. And I was like, you know, I found something that I haven't had in a long time and it was just joy and I, and gratitude, you know, I woke up every day grateful to be alive. And, you know, cause I was like, there's somebody out there that has it worse than me. Cause when I would go into those chemo centers and like, and here's the thing, I have a, like my cancer wasn't the worst cancer, but my chemo regimen was brutal, you know, A, B, V, D. Um, so doxyrubicin, bleomycin, um, then blasting is not, not, I mean, it's bad, but it's like those two bleomycin and doxyrubicin, you know, those are very, two very rough chemo, chemo treatments. And it's a, it's a cocktail, but here's the thing, you know, they put me on, I had like eight or nine medications they were trying to give me. So before those four chemo started, like you would have to take like four anti-nausea, this, 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 this. And I was like, you know, this stuff is like, I would feel like shit, like before the chemo hit me. And it was, it, it's something that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy to, to be put on that type of treatment. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting experience going into those chemo centers. Cause like I knew what I was doing was right. And I had scientific research to back this up and, you know, things that supported what I was doing. Again, it's hard to have like, you know, one, one really good scientist told me it's, it's hard like to have something that's pure hard science evidence you need like not just to run a study or two and have it reviewed, Like you need 10 years of research. You need, you need that. And then you need follow up. And then you have to keep proving and keep proving against like this, this, this. And when people like, you know, um, credit, not criticize, but you know, like combat certain things that you're saying, you have to be able to prove. Them. So it's like, none of that was proven a hundred percent. I had to go with what I knew was right. And here's the thing. It's like, whatever anybody says, it's like, well, doing that just cure your cancer outright. You know, I, not a hundred percent, it doesn't happen every time, but are your chances more improved if you take care of your health, your mindset and everything else? Yes. Your chances of survival. Like I didn't want, I didn't accept that 70 to 75% survival rate. I'm going to make my survival rate 99.999 doing what I know is right. Cause again, my, with my background, you know, exercise physiology, we, we learn like I learned nutrition 101, like so sophomore year okay, these vitamins and these minerals help keep your immune function strong. So when you're going, all those chemicals that they put into your body, you know, of course, the chemo, it kills everything good and bad. So it's not just killing the cancer cells, it's killing all of your good gut bacteria. It's literally killing everything. It's a nuke. So what happens when your immune system is tanked? It's like down here. And again, your white blood cell count is like, there's times when my white blood cell count was like, at the very bottom and and that's where a lot of a lot of people they don't always die from their cancer they die from a common cold they get pneumonia they 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 uh, scrape their knee and they get a, an infection and they die from like a staph infection or something like mm -hmm. there's a lot of water build up in the lungs i knew a couple people that died like that survived horrible cancers but then they end up dying from fluid build up in their lungs and you know all these things that you know could be avoided especially when it came to these infections and you know Get a flu shot. Sorry, what was that? Get a flu shot. That's my PSA. <laughs> and I was like, man, there's, there's things that you can do. And so when I started looking at and started talking with a lot of these other cancer patients, you know, because of the chemo, you don't eat. A lot of times, like water, it tastes like motor oil. Like, I mean, it, it, it tastes mm. horrible. That's why people don't drink. So again, it's not so much the cancer. It's the fact that they're depriving their body of all the essential nutrients that it needs. They're not drinking water. They're not, they might eat a, maybe a meal a day and have a snack or something. So again, they're dropping their metabolism, their lean body mass, their bone density. Cause here's the thing. It's not just like, that's going to drop because of everything going on, but the chemo itself, like my one chemo, like I lost a lot of my lungs. 
um, one chemo, basically my heart is like, you know, I, my heart's susceptible to failure later on in life. My bone dense, like one chemo eats away bone. So it's again, like you're losing a lot of these good things, but also like even just in our gut health in general, 60, you know, sorry, about 70 to 80% of our immune cells are in our gut. So if your gut health, all that good, healthy bacteria is destroyed, you know, again, it's leaving a lot of room for that bad bacteria to come in. And then it's like, that's why we have trouble digesting food. So again, we all know like, well, sorry, I can't say we all know this. You probably know like our, we have stomach acid. Our stomach acid helps break, like there's a process when we digest something. And when our gut gets too acidic, you know, we get that, we all know what acid reflux is. Acid reflux is like a normal thing for cancer patients. And it's like, you know, the only thing that helped me was my diet. That gave me energy. That gave me the ability to get up out of bed because I still had to work 80 hours a week. I didn't get no break. No one, like I still had a gym to run, but also I did, I trained six days a week. No, sorry. At that beginning time, I was only doing four to five because so my program, my protocol, I created a power body, it was actually like power bodybuilding program. I was lifting super heavy five by fives, four by six to eight. I really didn't do more than 10 reps, just pure power and strength. You created a program that most people won't do while they're totally healthy while right. you're battling cancer, getting chemo. Yes. Are you even a human? <laughs> Where'd you come from? Sometimes I ask myself that and then, God, <laughs> yes, you are. You are mortal. And yes, yeah. <laughs> but the thing people don't realize it because people, everyone thought I was crazy. My doctor thought I was fucking nuts, but I was like, <laughs> you just walked a step in my shoes. If you just knew where I was coming from and you tried it, don't, don't listen to what your medical books and your many years of school told you. Just try this and you will feel better. I promise you. Like that's what gave me life. The strength training. I had to build muscle. I lost, I went from like 245, pretty lean. Like I lost about 40 pounds of muscle and bone. My lean, my, my lean body mass during those six to eight weeks when I wasn't getting treatment, it tanked. I look like I went like it was, it was rough. And you know, I had to rebuild that. But you know, they always say like you can't, like when you're in that type of deficit, when you're going through all that, you can't build muscle, you can't build your bone back. I have DEXA scans proving otherwise. The right across Shit. the street is uh, is the exercise physiology lab at George Washington University. And you can go in there, get DEXA scans, and I'll get them regularly. So you could see how my bone density increased, my muscle mass increased. Like the month of August when I really, because I noticed my results. Like I was building my muscle back. I was getting strong as hell again. And it was for me, like that was mentally motivating because like, wow, what I was doing is right. You know, and part, there's a little part in the back of my head that wanted to prove my doctors and the nurses wrong as well. But yeah, that, that element helps a lot too. The <laughs> I mean, fuck you element. element. Yeah, they definitely fuel that fire, especially that that second doctor who I I, I had to let go when I went to my third oncologist because he was like, you know, he him and I argued about that a little bit, and um, and he was like, no, there's nothing you can do to improve. Like, no, this this like I was like, yes, there is. Like, I mean, I could literally. I'll bring my old textbooks in. I can show you how you can help your immune function. Is it going to make sure, is it, again, nothing's a hundred percent, you know, it's all probability. If you can increase your chance of survival, why not do it? Right. It was the worst part. And this is where like, I knew there was nothing I could do or say that would change their mind. Cause when you go into that chemo center, the first thing you see is a big bowl of candy. The soda, uh, the fridge is full of sodas, Mountain Dew, Coke, all of that cookies, cakes, ice pops, all comfort food. There is not mm. one healthy thing other than the little mini bottles of water that was in there. That makes zero freaking sense. It was mind boggling. And I was like, how do you think this is right? You know, I, I don't, I'm not one of those like crazy alkaline people that are like, you know, sugar causes cancer because it, it doesn't. It, like there's a, there's a whole chain reaction of things that happen that can increase cancer cells and tumors if you increase your insulin. Anyways, but my whole <laughs> point being, it's like, there are things you can do and you have to like, again, you have to feed the, you have to feed the machine. If your if, if your body's getting beaten down and broken every single day, when you go into that chemo center, it's even worse because they're pumping those chemicals into you. You have to give your body the fuel. It's just like, again, it's like any other machine. If you're running your car, like, I mean, I, I give this uh, analogy to my clients all the time. I and mean, if you had a, you know, a Ferrari, you're not going to go to the shell and put regular gas in, and some shitty oil that's not meant for your, like, and you're going to take very good care of that car. Mm -hmm. Your body, you only have one. You can't take it back to the dealership and get a new model. It doesn't work like that. You know, you have one and you have to take care of it. 
and what the cancer taught me was that it's like there's a difference between being fit and a difference between being healthy. I was too focused on the fit and not making sure my body needed the healthy because I was doing all the basics. And I always, you know, I, I've been through a lot of shit. Like I said before that, I've had you know lots of surgeries and a lot of mishaps, and I always figure out like I was an anomaly. You know, regular diet when I tried cutting down didn't necessarily work for me. Like I had to do like I had to think outside the box my entire life. And but it made me it made me expand my my consciousness, it made me expand my awareness, and really learn these things. And that's also where I started really learning like the psychology and like learning the brain. Because really, a lot of what happened then, because when I I into intuition, when I was doing all this and I noticed what I was doing was helping, and it wasn't a placebo effect because I'm I'm very detailed on what I was doing, and it was like you know maybe a little bit, but it was like I have energy, I can remember, everything is improving, and I also have the stats to show it why not take this to the next level? And, um, you know, I was watching, I was watching one of Tony Robbins, uh, uh, documentary on Netflix called like, I'm not your guru. And like, I had this, like in the middle of that, I was so fired up, you know, cause everything I was doing up to that point, this is like right before August, like everything I was doing was working. And I texted this girl, like she's now my girlfriend at the time we were just, you know, she was helping me out with the nonprofit that I started. Um, so yeah, sorry. So really talking at my journey, I started a nonprofit called fitness fights cancer. Um, and it's really meant just to give people hope. And I wanted to document my journey and just show people what I was doing. Cause you know, if I can just help one person, you know, I, I did my job and, and I was like, how am I going to get my message out there? These people think I'm crazy. Um, I think I'm crazy a little bit, you know, but what am I going to do to really get the message out there? And I wanted to do something and it's something that's been taken away from me for the last four or five years. I like, I want to compete. And that's when, like, in the middle of that, I texted her, and I was like, all right, hear me out on this one. Just, just listen. In 14 weeks, I'm going to do a bodybuilding competition. And I'm going to compete, and we're going to raise money for children's cancer, and we're going to make – we're going to bring awareness to this subject. That, again, it was all – it was more mental at that time. Because, of course, like, I mean, I was documenting my things, but that's not a real scientific site. I can't just go walk into Johns Hopkins. Like, okay, guys, here's, like, you know – here's all my proof right I was like, if i can show you though how you can keep your body healthy you know how you can still build muscle and again increase in lean body mass also improves uh, immune function and so i was like all right let's take this to the next level so i signed up for that show and i was going to do it and uh and i knew i was going to get my ass beat and it was one of those like hey this is not about you this is not about your pride not your ego like this is you doing something for other people and, and to, to bring awareness, not just for cancer patients and cancer survivors, but everybody else in their life who, who doesn't realize the significance of what improving their health can do for them and what, what taking care of your body, feeding it the fuel, and also the mental health aspect. Hey, no matter what your situation, there is something you can do. You know, if you're depressed, like, hey, this is, there's the physical part of depression, like deficiencies in the brain, underactive, overact, underactive and overactive areas. But then also there's the mindset and how to establish the goals. And again, perspective. Perspective was something I learned the most. Because again, like I would sit in that chemo, like some of my happiest days were sitting in the chemo center. And like, and I would go straight from chemo back to work, you know, the, the evening shift, training clients. And it was all perspective. And some of my clients were like, you know, what are you doing? Do you want us to go? Like, we well, can go home and rest. I was like, no, if I go, if I go feel sorry for myself and I just go back and sit, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing myself any good. And and I was like, also, I, I need to make money because I have to pay for this stuff. So it was all perspective, but it was, I was grateful. And I woke up and I, and I learned later, because again, this kind of set me on a path, you know, to learn more about the brain and what gratitude can do. And, you know, there's an interesting study like John Hopkins, you know, they've, and multiple universities have done this, but they bring like monks over from Tibet and they study, they, they study their brain, you know, when they're meditating and all these different things. And when they feel gratitude, like, you know, they say like, you can see happiness on a brain scan. Go to, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the aiming clinic, you know, he's one of the world's leading, um, you know, he's actually a psychiatrist, but he takes a biology approach to the brain. And like, you know, he's done over 100,000 spec scans. And he will show you like my girlfriend actually went there years ago, she has a whole binder on her brain. Like they literally took a picture of her brain and told her when she had childhood trauma, like they, they, they knew her life Holy story. Holy shit. Like, I mean, no, really, like, they told her, it was like, you had a series event happen in your late teens that caused a very traumatic thing, and they could see that on her, a picture of her brain. She was How like, do yeah. they measure that? How can they tell? That is beyond my level of science. 
But like, it's interesting looking at the spec scans. I actually have, you know, I've done some presentations on it where I show like, you know, there's, you know, seven different types of ADHD. And like, you know, he's like, and I listened, I actually went to one of his lectures as well. And, you know, he talks about, you know, a lot of times when you're, when you're in high school and you have, you know, problems focusing, like, you know, we're just going to prescribe you Adderall or we're just going to give you Ritalin, whatever, whatever, whoever's paying that doctor to use that specific drug. But he's like, if you try and give one pill for seven different types of ADHD, like that's why these kids are failing long term. That's why it's causing more problems sometimes than it is good because you're trying, like, there are different parts of the brain. And he proved it. I mean, this is all like, you can see the different rings on the brain, the colors, and it's like, and he explains everything. And they have over 100,000 of these spec scans that they've done. And it's like, they are wow. proving this. And it, it's a very interesting science. You definitely have to look up Dr. Amen in the Amen Clinic. So again, like for me, like, I mean, in the last two years, I've read more books than I have my entire life combined. Like I've just been on this journey of knowledge, but honestly, it was cancer that opened that up for me. And it was cancer that really was like, you know, I, I enjoyed really learning again and expanding. And I, I learned, honestly, I got a little, like, even in my spiritual self. Because, like, when I talked about on that couch, that voice that really was, like, there was something else there. And, you know, that's a whole other story with my, you know, growing up, my, you know, religiously, like, not very religious. And, you know, I kind of found my spirituality. And that's where, you know, there is, like, you know, this higher power. There's some type of force that was pushing and driving me. And I had a purpose. Um, and giving you clients. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, so we, we end up doing this walk for children's cancer and I just kept growing and like even the month. So like one of my, uh, DEXA scans, honestly, like I put on more muscle mass in that month than a normal person can put with anabolic steroids. And I was like, you know, I put on eight pounds of lean muscle what? in a month. And That's I was crazy. like, and I was like, doc, like, Hey, look at my, my lean body mass went up in the, I was in the like 97th, 98th percentile for males my age. Um, but this was also when I was introduced to, you know, uh, a specific health line of supplements and things that really aided my nutrition. And this is what my girlfriend, Amy, introduced me to. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, I talk to people about supplements. It's an area that I've researched literally since I was 18, 19. I did projects on it in school. I used to pick apart the supplement industry because a lot of it, most of it's garbage. None of it's regulated by the FDA. You have to know what you're putting in. You have to trust a company and you have to, like, there's a lot of little aspects. So when, when she brought me this and I did my research and Dr. Plant, like he was their head you know, chief science officer, graduated first in his class from Harvard. He was part of the NIH. He ran a lot of the big studies, like, you know, very reputable guy. And I was like, okay, he has this, he has the reputation. Let me look at their products. And again, like I told you in the beginning, like I lost a lot of my lung function. I started taking very, like adaptogens have been one of the staple mark of my health. Literally, like, I haven't not taken my adaptogens in two years. Um, adaptogens are some of the most powerful herbs on the planet. And these adaptogens, uh, very specific ones I was putting on, like ashwagandha, alfalfa, ionic alfalfa, you know, Siberian ginseng. There's very specific ones, very alphanizing agents, but it increases oxygen uptake. So again, it more works like in with the mitochondria. And like, you know, when we take a breath, you know, in, in the book that I breathe that I was talking about with James Nestor, um, you know, he talked about a lot of times, like our body can really only absorb about 25% of that oxygen. Like when the mo oxygen molecules bond, like, you know, everyone, when they look at the lungs, think of it like the tree branches, you know, all those little, and it shoots it out throughout the, the body. Like uh, we really only get 25% of that breath. So a lot of times if we're just breathing, 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 we're putting in so much oxygen, that ratio of oxygen CO2 get thrown off. And that's where like, you know, like, you know, panic attacks. I'm sure you may have had people who have like, you know, panic attacks where they breathe into, you want to breathe in your CO2 to lower those oxygen levels. So sometimes you want to alkalinize your body. Sometimes you want to, again, bring a little bit more CO2 to balance it. So you're within that good range. So I had a pulmonary function test done in the beginning. I mean, my lungs were like, I was not putting out a lot of, you know, I was not putting out a lot. After using these products, I mean, I'm not saying supplements, like the name is the definition is meant to supplement your nutrition and supplement what you're doing physical activity wise. But what I saw was, I mean, I had the lungs at that, when I did that second test, I had the lungs of an Olympic athlete. 90, I was in the 99th percentile for my lung capacity and what I was able to take in and breathe out. And like the, the nurse was there, like, uh, I don't think this is an error on the screen. Like we're not, we're not having any problems, but like you're, I was like, Hey, I told you what I was doing was right. I mean, <laughs> the common sweet of vindication. And like, uh, there's this product called Nox, and it's probably one of the best pre-workouts. It's not, it's a non-stimulant pre-workout, but it's derived from beet juice, you know, beet juice and it's this garden blend. But I mean, it's something you take and within, you take it like two, three hours before, like you really want to peak. 
And it's like, you get this insane pump, but it's like, again, you're getting oxygen into your brain. You're getting oxygen into your muscles. I went from like, you know, my cardio was like 10 minutes of walking to 20 minutes of sprints after my workout, you know, everything just started clicking. And that's when I was like, there's something going on. Like my body, like I might actually have a chance to do pretty well in this show. Like at first I knew I was going to get crushed, but I was like, there's a chance that you might be able to go in here and actually do some damage. So that's when my ego kind of came in a little bit. And I was like, okay, now, <laughs> of course I'm doing this for the kid. I want to do this for good, but there's a little part of me that the, the competitor that just wanted to compete to win. Right. And I, I was building muscle. I was dropping the fat and, you know, I went into that show, you know, about, I weighed in 207 about, you know, I was about a little over like five, 5.2% body fat. Um, and, you know, I, I ended up doing pretty well. You know, I, I placed, you know, top five in all my categories. And in the big division, there were 16 dudes in the classic physique division. Um, I was fourth out of 16. And, um, Dude, that's you know, so I, badass. It was, it was intense, and it was, it was pretty cool. And, like, I was mad, actually, like, at the time. Like, I was actually – I was mad at myself because, like, I actually looked my worst during the judging. Bodybuilding is a very difficult sport where, like, literally the difference between you winning and you losing – like for me, like I wouldn't have won if I peaked. I would have probably been maybe second or third, probably third. But like it all comes down to what do you look like at that very moment, mm. right when you're in front of the judges during the pre-judging section. And I miscalculate because you do a whole depletion going up to the show. You deplete and then you backload, meaning that you, you cut your carbs, you go ketogenic. And then I was basically monitoring my you know electrolytes. And I was tightening up for the show. And then Thursday night, massive carb load. So again, you're doing this depletion to improve your body's production of insulin. Because again, insulin is a very powerful hormone for good and for bad. We talked about it like we don't want to spike our insulin, especially when you're going through cancer. You don't want to spike your insulin a lot through tons of sugars. Because again, that insulin is a growth hormone. Now, you do it with carb backloading because one, your body has to secrete it. But it's more of you want to spike it at the right times. And that's what my diet does. It specifically targets the right times when you want to eat carbs. And this diet is extremely effective when it comes to fat loss and, you know, improving your physique. Because, again, you're, you're, you're like fat burn, fat burn, fat burn, massive carb load. I eat 1,000 grams of carbs. You fill up your muscle cells. Now, carbs soak up water. So when you put the creatine, the leucine, all that, and the right amount of, like, a magnesium and uh, sodium, because you, your electrolyte balance, especially within the gradient, you have to pull all that water under the skin into the muscle, and that pushes against the skin. So when you see those dudes, like the bodybuilders, they look like just veiny. It's like, it's like, they only look like that one or two days out of the year. Like, it's that, like you're crazy that, dehydrated and like, it's super like that moment, that snapshot, at least like you're just very unhealthy, right? Know. People like the name, my, the reason why bodybuilding has a bad name is because people don't know how the body works and they try and dehydrate. Your muscle needs water. Those carbs need water. I didn't, I drink two gallons of water a day, alkaline water. I did not, I did not deplete my water. Because that water is what fueled my muscles, and it's what soaked up those carbs into my muscles, so it pushed out against my skin. Now, here's the part okay. where I really screwed up, and I looked my worst. It's because, again, in bodybuilding, the difference, I did not have enough sodium. I didn't account for the chemo has a very different, has an effect on your electrolyte balance. And, of course, no one's ever gone through chemo and did a bodybuilding competition, so I couldn't do any research on this, but it was like I didn't account for um, how my body would react. So I actually needed about three to four times as much sodium. So when I was going in front of the judges, my, like, instead of tightening and pulling all the water in, my water was coming out and I looked very, um, it's called spilling over. So like I was just sweating profusely, but all that water was supposed to puff out my muscles. I looked really flat because my, the water wasn't getting pulled in with the carbs. So my muscles weren't looking full. Like I have a before and after picture, like the night before the show and then the morning after the show where I literally look like two different human beings. Um, and it was literally just the difference between one more cheat night. And, um, wow. and so again, just a tiny miscalculation. And that's why I was really mad at myself. But then the next day I was like, okay, asshole. Like, again, this wasn't about you. Like, this is about doing something really good. And it was awesome because like, you know, some of the dudes, like, they heard about what was going on. So, like, in the mid, uh, at the end of the, so there's, like, a morning show where you do all the judging. Then the evening show is a lot more for, like, family and friends where, like, you do your 60-second routine. And right after I did my routine, like, the announcer was like, hey, man, like, we heard this backstage. Like, we, what are you going through right now? And that's when basically I stood in front of, like, 600 people, like, after I just did my 60-second routine. And I, I shared my story, you know, for about 10, 12 minutes. And everyone in the audience was like, uh, 
<laughs> what? Like, excuse me, like, what do you mean? And I told him, like, yeah, in two days from now, I have my last chemo treatment. And that's where I saw, like, people were just like, oh, shit, what are you doing here, man? And I was like, but I told him, I was like, hey, you know, and I, I gave him, you know, the main points of my story. And, uh, you know, I wanted them to really get something out of it. And I was like, hey, there's something you can do. It starts with the mindset and then do what you need to do to keep your body, keep your brain healthy and, you know, live whatever life that you want to live. Cause like, this is what makes me happy. And that's why I did this, but also it kept me healthy, kept me strong. And I knew like, there was not a single doubt in my mind that I was going to die. Never. Um, it was all just say, Hey, you know, we're going to get through this and we're going to teach other people how to do the same thing. And one day when I do have enough money, and so I've actually already talked with, you know, uh, one of the head, head professors at, uh, was it FAU or Florida Atlantic University? Yeah. Dr. Yeah, Bill, that's here in Boca. Um, Dr. Bill Campbell is one of the world's top exercise physiologists, nutritionists. He does all the big studies that have been coming out recently is all done by him. And uh, I even said to him one time, and, you know, I was like, hey, man, when I'm ready and I got the money, like, we're going to set up, we're going to set up some studies, some nutritional studies. And he was like, all right, man, you just let me know when it's that time. And. And I will get to that point. And that's what my nonprofit, that's what I'm doing with my nonprofit. It's like, you know, one of these, like my, my goal down the road is like, I'm going to build my cancer centers. I'm going to, I'm going to share with them all the technology. Cause like throughout this, like I did so many things to like, you know, outside of the box type of things, you know, to keep my body healthy and, you know, looking at the body from a whole different perspective where, you know, I believe like there's a triad of health, you know, there's three main pillars, you know, you have the structural aspect of your body, you have the chemical side of your body, and then you have your mental health. All three sides of this triangle deep, like, directly affect and correlate to the other two. And, you know, it's when, I, when you look at health and you really take such a complex subject where people really don't know what good health sometimes is. And, you know, a lot of times we're just, you know, trying a diet, trying this, trying that. And we don't realize what, what we're doing to our body long term. And it's actually, you know, I just uh, did a little lecture before this uh, in a group that I'm in about metabolism, why our body slows down with age. And I explained this, you know, how the body works all together. And it's about maximizing what you have. And that's what, you know, again, the supplement company that I do with Isogenics, like, again, they enhanced what I was doing with my diet. They gave me certain things that I couldn't get from food. Um, and it was like certain things that I overlooked when I was just trying to be fit. And I was like, you know, I want to be healthy now. And it's like, I don't want to be on all those drugs. Because like, you know, actually one part I forgot to say, like, you know, in the very beginning when I was on all those drugs before the chemo, like, I took myself off of everything. I took myself off of eight or nine medications and I was using my cannabis oils. They worked better when it came to the nausea and the digestion, they worked better than anything that they gave me in the hospital. But also like, I mean, those adaptive things that just kept me going and just kept, again, it gave me the, it gave me the, the, the tools and the resources to be able to, to push that hard. Um, and again, like I'm an outlier. I take things to the extreme. So it wasn't like I was just trying to be healthy during cancer. Like, Hey, I want to compete bodybuilding. Competition. You're the David Goggins of cancer. <laughs> oh man, that dude's a beast, man. I, right. I, I've, I, I couldn't even imagine like there's things about him, but he, you know, he kind of set me on another path where it's like, you know, I've, you know, I studied a lot, you know, when it comes to the brain, I'm also got really, you know, into actually studying, you know, philosophy and, you know, consciousness and the mind. Like I was fast. This made me fascinated about the human mind. Cause it's like, we really don't know as much as we think we know about it. And it's like, you know, it's an area that's such a black hole and you can dive very deep into it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can really help teach you and you can learn about that type of stuff, you know, different plants and medicines and things like that. And, you know, that's an area that I, you know, I've done a lot of research and I study as well. And like, you know, there's, you know, big thing in the cancer world. And this actually probably be the first time that I ever talked about it. It's like, you know, Johns Hopkins, you know, there's, there's a couple major universities in the world that have run studies on psychedelics. And, you know, one of the- I was about people, to ask you, I was going to be like, you ever tried uh, like psilocybin or anything like that? Cause I wouldn't, the first time I allegedly- Try psilocybin was it was after I read those Johns Hopkins studies you're talking about because I was super sketched out about uh, anything where I felt like I might not have control over what's going on. So anything that would really like, like weed was fine, other stuff was okay, but like anything that took me out of control, I was terrified oh. of. But then I read those studies, and I was like, okay, all right, I, I'm, I'm I'm eager to try this out. Yeah, and it was phenomenal. It it can give you a life changing experience, and honestly, like it. Because that was the same study I read, and I read through all of them all over the world. Uh, MAPS is a great organization. They have all of, every scientific study going on with psychedelics is on their website, and you can check it out. Um, they're in stage two and stage three trials, like, you know, um, with using MDMA on PTSD, you know, ayahuasca, DMT, psilocybin. Um, 
And uh, it, uh, in that specific John Hopkins ones, there was, you know, it was on cancer patients and it was more of removing the fear of death. And um, that was a huge, so for me, it wasn't so much like I knew that I was good. Like, I mean, I had this mindset, like, you're not dying, but once you're done, and this is actually the, the, the interesting part, most people don't think, I thought like when I was done with cancer, I was like, okay, boom, you, you, you did all that. When you're done, you're going to take off your business. Like everything in life's going to be great. It was the exact opposite. Cause it's like, it was a whole mindset shift when you're in that fight or flight and it's like, you're fighting for your life. Like it's a whole different level of adrenaline and like energy, like energy that you can't just get from food. It's like, it's a mental energy. Um, that's another area. Like, you know, I don't know if you, Dr. Huberman, um, he did the, the podcast with Joe Rogan about six weeks ago. He was a neuroscientist at Stanford, but he talks about, you know, this mental energy that we have when, you know, we release these endorphins, but it's more than that. It's like, and that's where like Dave and Goggins, it's like, you know, to be able to run 200 miles straight, like there's only so many calories in the body that you can burn. And it's like, there's only so much that you can get at one time. It's like, you know, it, it, it's amazing, you know, what the body is capable of when your mindset's to it. And so that was an area that I explored um, because and it gave me a whole different perspective on life. And honestly, like I literally solved like, you know, a lot of my childhood trauma and everything like you know, it would have taken maybe five or six years, seven years of therapy. I didn't like, you know, a month. And it was like, you know, and I really dove deep into a lot of different things. And I just kept learning, kept learning, kept learning. And it's like, you know what, I want to, you know, I want to improve, you know, what I'm doing, who I am. Like, I want to be better at what I do. I want to help as many people as possible. I want to contribute to the world. And it's like, you know, giving back more than you take. And that's what all this information, you know, I, you know, I could go on about like, my nonprofit and trying to help other cancer patients. It's not an easy thing, you know, especially like, even with my organization, when I was going through it, there's a lot of people that didn't even want to work with me and it's because what I represented was, you know, life and they, their, their child died or this, like, it, it's an interesting world. And that's why like, it kind of discouraged me a lot, actually, like trying to do some of my organizational, like, you know, events and stuff. Cause there's people that really didn't want to be a part of it. And it was like, they're stuck in this victimhood mindset. And, you know, it was, it, it, it's, it was weird because I never thought I was like, hey, we're all like, we're all in this together. Like, you know, you're doing this because you want to help other people. You want to bring awareness. You're raising all this money. It's like, why can't we like, you know, it, but, and that's why I learned like, you know, mindset and living in like, you know, I call it like above the line or below the line. It's like, you know, uh, positive, attractive fields and negative. It's like, you know, that negative energy, it's like, you know, living in, in fear and anxiety, living in, you know, hatred, you know, like everything under the line, like I would call like racism, not just that, but it's like everything negative and it just brings your whole energy down. And cause this thing, energy is palpable and you know, you can feel when someone's energy is off, you know, what is intuition? And it's like, you know, you can tell with some people and it's like, you know, I, I would get these vibes and I was just like, man, what is going on? Like we're, you know, and it discouraged, that's why I said like, I, there's a time there that I really didn't do a lot with my organization. I really just kickstarted back up over the last couple months um, cause I did have a falling out with one of my friends who was like, you know, the, you know, on the board, like we, we had to like let it dissolve. And then like, I started it back up and that's where like over the last, you know, the previous six weeks I did, this was called a symposium of hope. And it was like, you know, in this whole mist of COVID and everything that everybody's experiencing, you know, in the very beginning, you know, it was a little, not a joke in my head, but it was kind of like, you know, what you guys are feeling is what cancer patients went through every day. You know, if you step outside, like, you know, I was given, like, I didn't have a 99.996% chance of survival. I had a 75% chance of death, or sorry, 75% chance of survival. That's a very big percentage difference when it comes to life and death. Mm. And it's like, you know, I wasn't in fear to go to the grocery. Like, I, like, I could have caught in a cold from anybody. I could have literally picked up anything from anybody at any time. And, you know, that was actually one of the part of the stories I forgot to say is like, you know, I got a really, like, the only time I got sick, there was only one time, and it was, I caught a very bad chest virus. And, you know, this is something that could have turned into full blown, like, you know, into my lungs and pneumonia. it could have killed me. A lot of cancer patients, they would have been like my doctor said, most people would have been in the hospital for weeks and possibly would have died. Um, I was back in the gym lifting in 36 hours, you know, but it's because of what I did. And that's why I believe so passionately in what I do. It's because I've lived it. I've, I, I wasn't someone who just watched it and, you know, I walked in those shoes. I know what it's like to get hit like that. And I know it's like, you know, sometimes you don't know what you have until you lose it. A lot that can go for a lot of things in life. And, you know, when it's your health, you know, and you have a time limit on when you might, you know, be gone, like it changes your whole perspective on life. And, you know, again, like I'm 20, I'm, I'm about to turn 30 next, or November. 
And it's like, man, I, I, I need to get shit done now. It's like, I'm, I'm put, I put a lot of, I mean, it's a bad thing too. I put a lot of pressure on myself, but it's like, you know, time is more valuable than gold to me. It's like, you know, we can't get that back. You can't buy it. You know, you can extend it for a while, but hey, we're, none of us are making it off this planet alive. And it's like, what are you going to contribute? What are you going to do to make this a better place for the people who come after you? And that's what living in contribution is all about. And, you know, this nonprofit is like, you know what, everybody, what they're going through. Cause again, I have, I have a gym, like I have a lot of clients, you know, again, like I was rebuilding my business, COVID hits. We we're the first ones to get shut down. And, um, I was like, well, what are we going to do? And what are we, how are we going to help people through this? And, you know, that's why like I, there's a lot, there's a time I didn't really post a lot of stuff and, you know, it wasn't until maybe like late May or June when I was like, okay, I got to step in the, I got to step in the ring a little bit and really just educate people on the things that you can do. Um, cause again, I, I still work with a lot of those doctors, you know, one of my, my business coach, uh, or not, not my business, one of my leader, this leadership program I was in, um, she's a medical doctor, very, very reputable in New York. Um, she, her practice is right outside, uh, right outside Manhattan. Um, but she consulted with a lot of the hospitals in New York. She was the one who like, she, the first thing that she told a lot of these doctors, cause actually like one of her really close friends was on a ventilator and on their deathbed. And, um, she's like, this is what you're going to give him right now. Like this, this is first thing. And I have it all right up here. D zinc C selenium start with that. And then they did do the hydroxychloroquine and she's like, and she provided every sign. Like, and there are certain doctors that question it, but she's like, here, I'll send you this information, look at it. Again, is this the end all save all? No, but is it something that can improve your chance of survival? Yes. So was the person that actually changed my, my mind went back and forth a couple of times with studying like hydroxychloroquine. And you're actually the one that showed me data that was finally like, okay, I can't definitively say either way, but I, there, this evidence is pretty solid. And you're There's the one, like, I went through, like, I was at the airport and I spent like hours just going through everything that you sent me. And I'm like, well, motherfucker. Yeah, he's got a good point here. And, and that's where, you know, again, I'm not a medical doctor, you know, I, I know how to do research and like everybody else, but it's, it's sometimes it's hard to sift through it. And I remember there was one meta analysis that I posted, and I think you shared it as well at one point. And it was like, you know, they showed, again, there was like 65 studies total that it looked at. And again, a very high majority of it is like, you know, early use. And we know that early use, you know, and even like, again, it, if you get it late, but here's the thing, if you're on a ventilator, if you look at the percentage of death there versus, again, if you weren't on a ventilator and doing hydroxychloroquine, the hydroxychloroquine, like, you have a better chance of survival. Does somebody die? It is an unfortunate reality. And it's an unfortunate truth that people do die. Um, and, you know, this, this disease, it is real. I, I will never be one of those say that you know, it's, a, it's a fake. Like, it is a real disease. But I do believe, you know, the hype and the pandemic and everything that was created because of it was a little over exaggerated, but here's the thing. I have empathy and compassion for that because I know what it's like to live in that fear. I know what it's like where it's like, you know, if you're an obese person who has a lot of deficiencies and you're like, okay, well, I know if I go outside, if I, you know, don't worry, I'm like, I'm gonna, I can get this and I could possibly die. A lot of people lived in fear and I know what that's like. So it's like, I understood where people were coming from. I just didn't want to like lose my whole business again because of it, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, we're, re- we're rebuilding it but I was like hey and this is what I try to tell my clients there are things you can do this is stuff that is like here is this study on vitamin d here's um oh why am I drawing a blank on her name uh she was on Rogan as well she talked about vitamin d uh, um oh no I know exactly what you're talking about so you're trying to say that's when I first heard about the vitamin d stuff and it was like you know these are very simple things that you can do like you could go to the grocery store get those four four vitamins and minerals and again, like you can boost your immune function. I have one of my supplements is the, uh, you know, it's a blend of adaptogens and it's called immune support. You know what I do with isogenics. I did, I'm doing everything I possibly can. Cause again, like for me and all other cancer survivors, when you go through all that, like my body needed more. So when I was talking with my coach and she was like, this is what she was doing for these people in New York. And she was saving a lot of lives, but she's like, you Sam, like, because you're a cancer survivor, you, you need more because again, like your body's not going to go back to normal for another year two, maybe three. That's what happens with chemo. It's not just like, you're not done once cancer is done. Like my body, like my brain's not going to be normal for another year or two. And I had multiple doctors. I, I haven't accepted that. I'm proving that <laughs> wrong as well. But my point <laughs> being is like, you know, um, Hey, you have to, you have to know your body. You have to learn what your body needs. Cause we're all different. There's no one diet that fits all. There's no, again, there's no one single drug, like, you know, until, 
you know, again, the whole vaccine thing, like I'm not a big fan of this rushed vaccine is not, there's just not too, there's too many things I feel could go wrong with it. And I'm not going to be the one to get tested. But I was like, in the meantime, what can we do? Work out, get air, get exercise. That is essential. Learn how to actually breathe. This affects our lungs. Everybody should read the book Breath by James Nestor. You read that book, you will you can see how you can the most simple way of learning how to breathe. Um, and believe it or not, like I've been actually like changed because I'm, I'm a habitual mouth breather. And believe it or not, like it causes like a lot of mental mental stuff. Like because again, if there's an imbalance, if there's a chemical imbalance in your brain, especially with oxygen and CO2, you're more susceptible to anxiety, to depression, to fear. So like all this whole COVID, it's a cocktail for disaster because not only is it like you know, it's, it's a disease that affects our lungs. There's a lot of other symptoms if you get it, like, you know, tiredness, drowsiness, all that stuff. But my main point is like the fear. When we live in fear, we're in fight or flight, cortisol, stress. What, hap- what does stress do to our immune function? It plummets it. So it's like we're in this cycle that it's like, you know, it's all about perspective. Again, when I was going through cancer, I could have looked at my cancer as a death sentence, as a, like, oh, God, I'm going to lose all my money. I'm going to fucking do like, all this is going to happen to me and my life's going to be miserable for six months. Or I can look at it as it as a growth area, something that I can build and grow off and I can learn. This is an area that people like, you know, we should be learning. We should be taking better care of ourselves. That should be the message that's put out there. And unfortunately, you know, with the media, all you see is the death count, the numbers, like, you know, they're not, they're not kind of going in between the lines and saying, where are these numbers coming from? What are the demographics that are, this is hitting and we're learning a lot of it is, you know, a high mor- 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 morbidity rate is obesity. Obesity is a huge factor. And the one, one big study in the Philippines, um, I think it was like 90 to 95% of the, the deaths, they're vitamin D deficient. Mm-hmm. So it's like, again, and I think, again, 4% of the, de- the deaths did have, uh, they were normal vitamin D levels, but still 4%. So again, like if you're 96%, like you're going to improve your chances of survival because you're taking vitamin D, like that's something you do every day. Like, you know, Hey, why not take that 99.96 to 99.99996 just by doing the simple things. And again, washing your damn hands, like simple stuff like that, like don't be dirty. And I know a lot of those people out there aren't putting on a new N95 mask every time. Like they're putting it in their car, they're grabbing it and just smacking it. It's like, all of y'all are putting on those dirty ass masks (laughs) that you you guys are probably passing that shit to each other all the time. But you know, it's like, Hey, we, uh, there, we can go on. I'm sure we could talk a lot about about that. Oh, dude, there yeah. are so many. There are so many questions I wanted to ask that I've been like, holding back on because I know it's gonna take us down another rabbit trail. But like, this will not be the last time we talk here for sure. Hey, I mean, honestly, I, I got time. If you want to ask those questions, I mean, you know, the last thing I really wanted to say was like, you know, if anyone's interested, like, you know, my symposium of hope, fitness fights cancer. You know, basically why I did this event was to really just share with with people what what we're doing, what cancer patients go through. But it's more of a mental aspect, you know, and a lot of my the, the stories I had were people who had it far worse than me. There's one guy on there that was told that he, he had, you know, you might die in five days. You know, you might not make it out of the hospital. And it was like, you know, these people came back and fought. And it's like, but they did everything they could. It was a mindset. And it's like, and they found a way. Whatever medicine, whatever nutrition, whatever they had to do, they did. And then I also had doctors on you know, one of the doctors did have cancer and, you know, he talked about his, you know, his, his journey and what he had to do. And I also had that other doctor who, who shared with me that information about hydroxychloroquine, vitamin D, C, you know, everything that she was doing to help save people in New York. And she shared, and I mean, she could go on and on about the medical field, but it's like, I brought in these specialists cause like, I want to share this with people. And I know like for me, I get mad at myself cause like I'm a terrible promoter. I'm not an Instagrammer. Like, you know, I can't like, you know, my, my, I'd rather like I'm in the trenches doing this. Like I, I, I wanted to make this bigger than what it was. And that's, that's like my own little ego thing. It's like, but it's like more, I want to share this with everybody. It's like, you know, if more people knew this, we could save a lot of lives. Also, I mean, people would be happier. If you're, if you're healthier and you're happier, you know, you're not going to like, you know, the world would be a much better place. And that's where literally my message lies. And it's like, Hey, let's do what we can. If, you can only change the world if you change yourself. You know, if, if you're beaten down, broken, and, and even if you're dead, you're not going to go change anything. Like, you you know, you have to give yourself that fuel. You have to build that fire. And that's what the mind comes in. And it's like, then you can do anything you, you want to do. Yep. Well, it's like Jordan Peterson's first rule in 12 Steps for Life. Yep. Clean your room. 
bring some kind of order to an area you can control and then you get the confidence. Okay, well, I can bring some order to this. Well, then I'll work outwards from that baseline. Mm -hmm. So it's such that I've read that twice. Oh, audiobook twice because he actually reads. I can't do audiobooks if the author doesn't read it. It seems weird to me. But I, I feel you there. I definitely feel you there. Fortunately, Dr. Jordan Peterson does narrate his book. But <laughs> um, so do we'll make sure you plug all your stuff. This is uh, this will be part one of a multiple one that we'll do another time for sure. But yeah, I want to plug all your stuff, plug your organization, what you're doing, the gym, everything. Yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you a couple links. So right now, I'm like my main website's under construction, but um, what I have is like our Symposium of Hope link. You can click on that. Again, you just get to join our, our Cancer Fight Club. And then from there, um, you can see all our videos and get all the cool information in there. Awesome, man. Yeah, unlike the uh, the regular Fight Club, Cancer Fight Club, you definitely talk about. <laughs> Share that shit Absolutely. everywhere. And I'll have, I'll make sure I get links from you and I'll put them all in the descriptions for all the different episodes too, the audio and the YouTube version. But dude, sure. thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation. And I, like, I, I, you know how the conversations we have, like I, we share a lot of the same interests and we know a lot of the same stuff, but you like, there's a lot of stuff I learned today talking with you. So I really appreciate that. Man. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I can shed some light on some areas and we'll definitely have to, you know, do part two. And I know I, I really expanded on that story there. I didn't get to answer all your questions, but you know, I'll be next. No, time man, that was, that was perfect. Yeah. We'll get into, we'll talk philosophy and we'll talk some shop and stuff very soon. I'm sure dude, but dude, thank Absolutely. you again. Absolutely. All right. Later, man.